All right, so last week we said we're taking a hiatus for the Leviticus series for a variety of reasons. The elders thought right now it would be a useful time to teach on uh, the biblical covenants and their theology. And if you were with us last week, what did we talk about? Ah, the covenant with Noah, yes. And um, we also talked about how there, it seems like there probably was a covenant with Adam, although that language was not used in Genesis um, but the covenant with Noah. And somebody remind me of a few of the things that we saw in uh, last week about the covenant with Noah. Oh, good grief. I have to skip like 80 slides. Okay. Well, while I'm skipping 80 slides, somebody remind me what we talked about with Noah. Tell me more about that. Um, when they got off the ark, um, when the, the first thing that was done was an altar was built and Noah sacrificed from the clean animals. Yes, and why was that significant? So in Hebrews chapter 9 it says that every covenant comes into force upon the death of something. And so it seems that apart from whatever this covenant with Adam might have been, death, uh, you will see a context of sacrifice for at least most of the rest of the covenants. Um, that's certainly true of Noah. What else did we see about the, the covenant with Noah last time? There's some provision for like a justice, a justice system almost. Of, yes. Um, you know, there's there's penalties if you kill someone. And, yes. And there's also a mention of animals will, will have fear and dread of people, which made an interesting point, which at this point is, is now very beneficial because in a fallen world, animals can be hostile to people, yes. so it's good for them to be afraid of us. Yes. Yeah, many of the things that were said to Adam are basically restated to Noah in the context of a fallen world. So Adam was told, be fruitful and multiply. Noah and his sons were told, be fruitful and multiply. Adam was told, here's some food for you to eat, but Adam was given what? Uh, was, he, was Adam given everything? Only the, the stuff off trees, right? But after death enters the world, God says to Noah, you can have not just the plants, but the animals too. But there's a, there's a restriction. Don't eat what? Blood. And, of course, Adam was given a restriction. You can eat all these kind of trees, but don't eat from one particular tree. Don't eat from the tree in the midst of the garden. So there are really strong parallels there. There are responsibilities on both sides. There's a uh, promise that God makes to all life on earth, which was, yeah, never to destroy the world by flood again. And there was a visible sign for the covenant. Most of the signs have a covenant. What was the visible sign of the covenant with Noah? The rainbow, that's right. All right, now today we come to the covenant with Abraham. And what is, can somebody tell me, what was, what's the big event that happened between Noah and Abraham. Sodom and Gomorrah got wiped out. Well, that's after Abraham. Babel. That's right, Babel. And what happened at Babel? Oh man. Let's build a tower up to heaven. Okay. And then, and and what was wrong with that? Uh, it was it was uh, extreme arrogance. Yes. To suppose that you know we in our effort can build our way up to God. Yeah. Um, it wasn't a very tall tower because God had to come down to look at it, and then He confused their language, and and uh, they kind of dispersed them, and they could not finish the work. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. If you actually look at the, the the tallest tower-like structures in that part of the world, they're about as tall as the hospital right here. So that's probably the size of what Babel looked like, or the sugar factory down on, uh, on 90. So um, it, those two buildings are almost exactly the same size. Yeah, so uh, people made this tower. God judged them. God dispersed them. And, and what did God do as he dispersed them by language? What was the result of that? People go to where they can understand folks. So what, what is formed as a result of that? Yeah. yeah, that's right. This is Deuteronomy 32. Yes, this, no, but that's exactly right. God, God created nations 
as a judgment on humanity. Humanity said, we want to be one. God says, no, you're going to be many. One human race turns into many nations. And then, as Debbie says, yeah, Deuteronomy 32 says those nations were actually handed over to the demons for judgment. Okay. Now, that's the backdrop to the covenant with Abraham is Babel, the fragmentation of humanity into many nations. And now, out of all these nations, God is going to create his own nation and work through it to deal with all the other ones. That's, that's basically the big picture of what's going on. All right, so after the report, report of Babel here, as we see our timeline, uh, we find this. Somebody read Genesis 11, 27 through 30 for us. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren, she had no child. As we're introduced to Abram and Sarai, we're introduced immediately to the problem, which is uh, Sarai's inability to conceive. And that's going to be a major idea across the course of the narratives concerning Abraham. Now, shortly after this introduction to Abram, who becomes Abraham, uh, what happens? How does Abraham start to interact with God? Does he say, you know, I really think this, this idea of God is cool. Like, I'm going to go seek him out. What happens? Yeah, God speaks to him. God calls Abram. Somebody read for us out. Uh, okay, well, before we read this. All right, now, now we get to... God's interaction with Abraham. And if you know this text well, you'll know that basically promises are made to Abraham on four occasions in chapter 12, 15, 17, and 22. And scholars debate, is there one Abrahamic covenant or are there four or are there three or are there two? How do we understand how all of these texts work together? Now, as I said last week, my goal here at the beginning of this series is just to present raw biblical data, but I do think, based on some of the stuff I wrote on the whiteboard, where I showed you last week the Hebrew terms that are used to describe the formation of a covenant, to cut a covenant, that most likely we should understand the covenant proper happens in chapter 15. That God makes some initial promises which are not the covenant, that some stuff happens, God makes a covenant with Abraham, some more stuff happens, God restates the covenant with Abraham, some more stuff happens, and then God swears an oath at the end of Abraham's life and says, I'm going to, I'm going to really fulfill this. Okay, so that's, that's how I think the data works out. I think we'll see that as we proceed here. All right, so let's now talk about the initial promises that God made to Abraham. Somebody read for us Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, now, who here has ever done like a real study, serious, lengthy study on covenant, the covenants before? Anybody? Okay, so one of the things a lot of people get excited about is the idea of some of the covenants are claimed to be conditional and some of them are claimed to be unconditional. And the idea is conditional covenants require effort for man and unconditional covenants are just God himself doing everything. And this is, a, this is often said to be a really important distinction in understanding the covenants. The problem is people that take that view will look at this and say the Abrahamic covenant was entirely unconditional. Abraham didn't have to do anything. God did everything. That, that distinction between con conditional and unconditional is not useful because what we find when we look at the, all the covenants is all of them require something of people and all of them require a lot from God. Um, and this is no exception. So I, I, I put that out there. I know this is being recorded in case that some people do encounter this. Um, that's probably not the most helpful way to think about this. If we really want to understand this, what we need to do is look carefully at what's actually said in the text and allow that to drive our theology rather than just imposing categories on the text. All right. In Hebrew, what we find here are two imperatives upon Abraham. What's an imperative? I must do a command. Okay, so structurally there are two imperatives 
upon Abraham, and then each imperative is followed by God declaring three blessings. So one thing you'll see when you look at these texts is they all follow a very rigid structure. It's not by accident. God is highlighting the importance of these promises and this covenant by using a very clear structure so that ancient people reading this, ancient people reading this didn't have like stuff printed in nice neat books with headers and footnotes and all of this. If God wanted them to perceive structure and importance, he had to build it into the architecture of the language. And that's what we see here. So we find structure here to highlight for the Israelites how they're to understand this. Two imperatives and each imperative is followed by three promises. Now the first imperative is what? What's the first thing God tells Abram that he has to do? He has to go. He can't just stay in Ur. If he stays in Ur, none of the rest of this is going to work out for him. Okay, so he's got to go. Oh, cool. I made it blue. Okay, he's got to go. Um, and he's got to go where? To the land. And what, is, what, what does the text say about that land? It's the land that God would show him. God's going to take him to a new place, and, and that's the land he's to go. And later in this chapter, we find that's exactly what takes place. Somebody read verses 5 through 7 for us. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. Okay, so that's the land. There's a specific plot of land. It's the land where the Canaanites were. Abram goes there and God says, this is it. This is the land. Okay, now let's go back to our passage. There's an imperative go, and it's followed by three blessings. And let's look at these blessings now. The first one somebody read for us, what's in red up there? Now, this has a context. What just happened before Abram came onto the scene? We already talked about this. This is not a trick question. What just happened? The scattering, the formation of nations. So we read this in the context of Babel. All the nations go out. God says, I will make of you a great nation. God didn't just pick one of the nations. God says to Abram, I'm going to make a nation, and it's going to happen through you. Now, if that's going to happen, what has to take place in Abram's life? He's got to have children, and like just a handful? A lot. I mean, a nation's like, you know, that's not really a small unit of people. Uh, now, what's the problem? Yes, there's an infertility problem. We saw that in the introduction with Abram, right? And so right away, we, we get, when we look at this in context, we see God's making a really tremendous promise to Abram. I'm going to overturn the problem of infertility in your life, and you're going to have a lot of descendants, and you're going to be the solution to what I just did at Babel. Humanity's under judgment. The solution's going to come through you, okay? That's a big promise. All right, now the second one here. Somebody read for us whatever color that is. I'll bless you. Um, when we think of blessing, what do we think? God's favor. That's good, yeah. Um, how does God's blessing usually manifest itself in, in our era, in the, New Test, in the New Testament era? Are we promised health and wealth and all that good stuff? Not so much. Yeah, spiritual blessings, Ephesians 2. But in the Old Testament, it is very much connected to prosperity and fertility, Okay. Um, and, and like uh, military victory. And so all these things are favor that comes from God. In, and that's how the Old Testament conceives of blessing. So Abram's going to have a big number of descendants. He's going to have uh, a nation that proceeds from him. That's going to happen because God will empower him to that end, conferring fertility and prosperity. And then what's the last one we see here? I'll make your name great. And you say, what's that mean? We find this same phrasing later in the, New Test or in the Old Testament, and it speaks of, like, kings. God promises the same thing to David. I'm going to give you a name like the great ones of the earth. And shortly after this, does Abram encounter any kings? Well, Melchizedek, good. Who else? Yeah. Oh, Ketoliomer, yeah. And, and, oh, boy, that's very good, Debbie. Who else? <laughs> 
Pharaoh, yeah, who else? The king of Sodom, Abimelech, the guys that he chases out of the, the region. Like, Abram becomes like the kings of the region. He is an important figure that is treated with, who is able to deploy an army, who's able to kick butt in war. Abram is, is like a peer of kings. That's what this promise says, and that's in fact what happens to him. Okay, so that's the first group of things there. Go, and these are the, the promises God makes. Any questions about that? Oh, didn't I say last week I wasn't going to take questions? Okay, well, don't worry about that. All right, let's come to the second complex now of command with blessing. So I don't see another command here. That's because the, uh, most of the English translations have translated the next Hebrew imperative uh, so that you will be a blessing, which is a result clause. But in Hebrew, the words so that you will have been supplied in English. That's not actually in the Hebrew. What's in the Hebrew is an imperative that says be a blessing. Be a blessing. Um, probably this is because of the lingering influence of the King James Version that many translators follow uh, this phrasing. The, that the King James Version still has great um, influence as translators work. Uh, but in, again, in Hebrew, it's very clear this is an imperatival form, um, be a blessing. So that's the command. You say, well, what, what does that mean? Who ultimately does blessing flow from? God, right? So Abram is to be a conduit of God's blessing. Blessing really comes from God, but Abram is to allow himself to be used by God so that blessing runs through him to others. And what that looks like will become clear as God makes more and more promises to him. But God now makes three supplemental promises related to this command. All right, oh, I didn't put those in bold. Okay, somebody read the uh, red one for me. I'll bless those who bless you. Now, uh, the word those suggests uh, many or few. Many, right. So there's an expectation that as Abram lives this out, he's going to encounter many people that will bless him, that will honor him. And as that happens, God will, will bless those people. So that's how Abram is going to be a conduit of blessing to others, is that as they re interact with him, most of the time it will be a positive interaction and they will be blessed. All right, now... Somebody read the orangish yellow one. All right, is that a many or a few? Few. Him, that's a singular, right? It says, I'll bless those, plural, but him who dishonors you, it's singular. God's telling Abram, in your dealings, uh, most of your dealings will be positive with people. There, there will be some negative, but mostly positive. Now, that's not the case for Abram's offspring, but that was the case for Abram. Him who dishonors you, what? I'll curse. Okay, that's the opposite of blessing. If blessing is prosperity and fertility and success, then, then curse is like death and frustration and failure. And so to interact with Abram positively, you receive God's blessing through Abram. To interact with Abram foolishly is to receive life disaster. That's the promise God makes Abram. And then finally, what's the, the one we see here in green? This is really important language because when we come to the New Testament, this is the promise that is amplified over and over by the New Testament writers and says this is fulfilled in Christ. That the blessing of Christ goes to all the nations. This is actually how Babel is reversed. This is the, this is the big point. You say, how is, how is Abram going to be a blessing to all the nations? Because the descendant of Abram is Jesus. And, and in Jesus, the gospel goes not just to, to Israel, but to the Gentiles too, and so truly to all the nations. Um, and so again, in the context of Babel, we read this very differently, I think, than if we just read the verses by themselves. Babel is the problem of judgment. The solution is Jesus through Abram, right? Right? And, and and that's often how things work is God pronounces judgment and judgment is a problem and then God saves through judgment. Right? God says sin deserves death and hell. Here's Jesus, right? Back then God said, hey, sin deserves fragmentation and dispersion. Here's Abram. And Abram ultimately points to Jesus. Okay, so that's the initial promises made to Abram. 
What happens after chapter 12? I'm going to look at Ed because he's usually my Old Testament guy. Well, at chapter 13. That's right. In chapter 13, Abram and Lot move to the land and they decide they need uh, to be in separate areas because they both got big flocks. And then what happens in chapter 14? Sodom, well, Sodom comes into view, but it's not the judgment on Sodom yet. Lot goes to live near Sodom and some bad guys come through and they beat up a bunch of people and steal a bunch of stuff and they kidnap Lot. And what does Abram do? Yeah, he fields an army and goes out and defeats the, the combined forces of five local chieftains or kings. Okay, now that is, and then there's the incident with Melchizedek where he tithes to God through the priest king Melchizedek. Okay, um, oh, I forgot to ask about the rest of chapter 12. Before all that happens, how's chapter 12 end? Isn't this sad? God says, not you guys, but the, this chapter. God says, have some promises. Have some big promises. Have some great promises. Here's a land, and here's all the stuff I'm going to do through you. And then famine hits the land. And what's Abram do? He says, I'm out, God. There's no food here. I'm going to Egypt. And he goes to Egypt, and he encounters Pharaoh. And Pharaoh likes Abram's wife. And Abram says, oh, that's my sister. If you like her, it's okay with me. But who wasn't it okay with? God. And the result is a, a judgment breaks out in Pharaoh's house of a plague. Did Abram serve as a conduit of God's blessing to the Egyptians? No. In chapter 14, did Abram serve as a blessing to the people he warred against? No. So Abram is not off to a great start here. Now, at the end of chapter 14, we read this. Somebody read this for us. This is really important to understand the context again. Just as understanding Babel really helps us understand the Abrahamic promise, understanding the end of chapter 14 helps us understand the Abrahamic covenant. Somebody read chapter 14 for us. Uh, verses 21 and 23. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. What's Abram's concern here? Who gets the, the credit for who, this? Who gets the glory for the victory? And Abraham doesn't want to keep all the plunder he took from those kings, because if he does, then the king of Sodom can say, ah, Abram, I made him a big man. And Abram says, no, 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 God made me a big man, not you. He's, he's protective of God's glory. Okay, that's the background now to what we see in chapter 15, which is the covenant proper. Now, in chapter 15, yes? So that statement by Abram, Abram, yeah. sounds like he had responded to God with murder and that God said it too, right? Because he made it for Benjamin and him. Oh, Yeah. Abram is the father of faith. I mean, many times Abram undertakes amazing uh, deeds of, of faith and has great trust in God. And then just like us, many times he goes off and does something incredibly foolish, um, which I find to be encouraging. You know, I think so often we read the Bible, we're like, oh, these guys are like plaster saints. No, no, no. The, the, God's people have always been fallible like us in every age. And uh, even back to Abram, who is set forth for us as this great example. And so, yeah, I mean, here's, here's an, immediately after some folly, here's Abram doing something quite proper, which God is about to reward. Okay, so now we come to 15. And at 15, we're going to look at two of the promises in particular that God highlights. The promise of descendants, which was, I'll make you a great nation, and the promise of land, right? Go to the land that I will show you. You'll notice that, again, God has built architecture into the language here. There's a repeating pattern. God makes a promise. Abram whines, God reiterates the promise. Now here we're going to see Abram with a little bit less faith than he should have, and God still is blessing him. Right? This is not entirely contingent upon Abram. In fact, we're going to see at the end of the covenant ritual, God does something that says, actually, this whole covenant will be fundamentally enabled and performed by me, even though I'll use you to do it. 
okay? But let's look at these two promises now. The first one is the promise of descendants. Somebody read for us Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. Okay, what is God promising Abram here? What, let's, let's look at the text. Specifically, what, does, what two things does God say to him? He'll have a, shield. a shield. He'll have great reward. Why are those things of value to Abram after chapter 14? What happened in chapter 14? There was war. And he gave up the reward. That's exactly right. There was war. He beat some really tough guys. What might Abram be concerned about? Those guys are going to come back and beat me up and take, some, take the stuff again. God says, don't worry about that. I've got your back. I will protect you. Fear not. Second, as Debbie points out, Abram just turned down a big reward. He didn't take the plunder. God says, hey, don't worry about that, Abram. I'm going to reward you. You're going to have a big reward. Right? And so what we see here immediately is God responds to Abram's concerns that must have been lingering after the events of chapter 14. Now, we say, what is this reward? I'm glad you asked. God's about to tell us. But before God says anything about it, Abram's going to do some whining. Somebody read verses 2 and 3. I know, what was God's very first promise to Abram? I will make you a great nation, which impliedly said, I will reverse the infertility issues, I will give you many descendants, and now sometime later, what's Abram's point? Where is it? I still don't have a kid, the guy who's going to inherit is a servant in my household. Okay, now God reiterates the promise. Somebody read verses 4 through 6. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Okay. God reiterates one of the, the essential promises of the covenant, which is you will have lots of descendants. And he illustrates this dramatically by pointing to the stars of the sky. Abram, God is saying, you will have a natural son as an heir. You will ultimately sire a vast number of descendants. And does Abram whine this time? How does he respond? He believes the Lord, and it's credited to him as righteousness. And that becomes a very important verse that we see throughout the New Testament that reminds us again and again, God's grace is received through faith, not works. If Abram's judge all works, if Abram's getting stuff because it works, he's in big trouble because we've already seen he's blown it. But God counts it to him as righteousness because he simply believes God's incredible promise, which he has seen no visible evidence of thus far. Any questions about that? Okay, now let's come to the second part of the covenant. Verses 7 through 21. All right, somebody read verse 7 for us. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. All right, now what's the promise God set, re, re, uh, points to now? Is it descendants? It's the land. All right, now here's Abram's going to whine again. Somebody read verse 8 for us. But he said, O Lord God, so again, his point is, remember the first time God says, I'm going to give you some descendants, he says, I see no visible evidence of it. And God says it's going to happen. Here God says, I'm going to give you the land. He says, I see no visible evidence of it. Because who's living in the land? The Canaanites. It's filled with Canaanites. He's not seeing a vast number of people taking possession of this land. So now God's going to reiterate the promise again. All right, now this is... Let's just turn to our Bible because I'm worried that the whole text isn't going to be, appear on the screen. 
Genesis 15, and I'll read verses 9 through 21 here. Before we read this, or as you're turning, what is the Hebrew verb that is used to signal the formation of a covenant? Karat, which means to cut. And we said that's because the most ancient form of covenant ceremony that we see in the ancient Near East and throughout the Bible involves the cutting of animals in half, which is a a very symbolic thing. It says, here's death, and in this death, let this happen to me if I violate the covenant. Okay, that's exactly what God's now going to do with Abram. He's going to repeat this ritual. Verse 9 God said to him, uh, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. This is language that we'll see later in in Exodus that speaks of the presence of God being there, which is a terrifying experience. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Now, what's that talking about? So what he says is, Abram, you're going to have a big number of offspring. They're going to go somewhere else, not here. They're going to go to Egypt for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. That's what happened in the Exodus. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God says, look, I'm going to give your people this land after the Canaanites sin enough that it's just for me to judge them. Now, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. That is the pieces of the dead animals. What is that? That's a visible representation of God. Okay, so to enter into a covenant, you had to walk through the severed pieces of the animals. They were saying, let this be done to me if I violate the covenant. Does God make Abram walk through the pieces? No. No, the only one who walks through the pieces is God. God is therefore undertaking the the totality of the covenant obligation upon himself. Abram's not being told, hey, this is contingent on you, buddy. Yes, Abram has imperatives he must fulfill. We'll see that. But it's ultimately going to be God who makes sure Abraham fulfills them. God alone walks through there. God alone undertakes the total responsibility of the covenant. And God undertakes this solemn oath, which says, if I break my part, may may I be killed. Now, can God die? So therefore, there's a great guarantee here that this covenant is going to come to pass and we read on that day the lord made a covenant he cut a covenant with abram okay so here it is this is really this is the abrahamic covenant saying to your offspring i give this land from the river of egypt to the great river the river euphrates the land of the kenites the kenizzites the Cadmonites, the hittites the perizzites the rephaim the amorites the canaanites the Girgashites, and the jebusites okay So God makes this reiteration. He enters into this sacred oath promising all of these great things to Abram. This is the the Abrahamic covenant. Okay. Any questions about this? Yes. Why does he not cut the the birds? It's a great question. Um, I don't know. Here's a chance I can say, I don't know. I don't know. And they're very small. Maybe that's why. Uh, and, you know, the sacrificial rite was different for birds when you come to Leviticus. So I don't know, but, but perhaps that's something to do with it. Um, all right. We've still got a few minutes left. Yes, ma'am. Just one thing that strikes me is on um, verse 16. Yes. That seems really similar to until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. The, the Israelites have to wait, right? Mm-hmm. 
Yes. It seems similar to that. Yeah, and when you see sometimes in the, in the Old Testament when God promises to bring judgment on nations, it's, it's as though there's a, there's a certain threshold of sin that must take place before God unleashes judgment. And that's because God is just. And so he, he is both patient and he waits for the right time to, to bring about uh, what is appropriate. Okay, now, I've still got like six minutes, so we're going to get as far as we can today, and then we're going to talk about New Testament connections with all of this next time. So this is kind of like a lesson in which most of the application is next week, but sorry. Um, what happens after chapter 15? Yeah, Hagar. Okay, so God said, hey, you're going to have descendants. Look at the, the stars of the sky. And Abraham believed God and was counted him as righteousness, and yet more time passes, and eventually Abraham and Sarah get impatient and Sarah says hey why don't you go have a kid with my handmaiden and what's the result of that Ishmael right now there's an illegitimate son a son who is not the son of promise Abraham the father of faith again shows himself to be a sinner and yet as we're going to see God's even going to turn that situation around for good now we come to chapter 17 here the covenant is restated and again, there is architecture to the language. Again, there are two parts. There's a promise connected to Abraham and a very similar pr promise connected to Sarah. And in both promises, we see the same events. God makes a promise. Abraham falls on his face. God makes a promise. And then there's something about the sign of this covenant. We'll see what the sign of this covenant is in just a minute. All right, so let's look at the first part here, the, the promise connected to Abraham. Somebody read Genesis 17, 1 and 2 for us. When, Ab when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Now you might see God saying here, I may make my covenant between me and you, and say, didn't God already do that? He, the, but what we have to know here is the word make here is not the word cut. This verb is not the normal verb meaning to make a covenant. This verb is probably basically saying, I will uh, restate the covenant. I will reaffirm the covenant. But as God restates his intention to reaffirm the covenant with Abraham, again, he imposes two imperatives on him, two commands. What are they? Walk before me and be blameless. I didn't put them in fun colors this time. Okay. Say, so what does walk before me mean? When you, when you do the word study on this, this is a commission to be an ambassador that represents God. So that's really strange, but that, you just have to take my word for it right now. When we see this language, this is God calling on someone to represent him, to go in, his, in advance of him, representing him. So Abram is to represent God. Why is... Why is Abram ideal? What, what about this whole situation with Abram and these promises makes Abram ideal to represent God in the world at that time? Where is Abram's land? Israel, right? And in the ancient world, uh, how did people get around? Did they get on airplanes? They'd walk, they'd take camels, right? And all the roads from east to west, from Egypt to Babylon, went through Israel. Everybody's going to come by and see Abram. And so if Abram's there at the crossroads of the world representing God, this is a great evangelistic testimony to the world. All the nations will be exposed to the truth about God. What's the second imperative? Yeah, be blameless. Abram, when you look this one up, basically, this, this, this usually means demonstrate what it looks like to belong to God. And, and that means Abram has to repent because he sins so much here, especially in chapter 16. But the point is, if you're to represent God, you've got to look the part. You've got to reflect upon God well. And, and that's something we see even on us today still, right? Here in, in two weeks' time, in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, Paul's going to say we're ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us be reconciled to God. That's, 
That's a command that's put upon believers today. That finds its origin all the way back here when God says to Abram, I'm going to put you at the crossroads of the world, and you're going to represent me to all the nations that come by. You need to cut all this stuff out. You've been doing all this folly. You need to reflect me better before all those people who are going to come by. All right, we'll stop here. So we'll pick up in Genesis 17, 1 and 2 next week. And it won't take us very long to get through the rest of chapter 17. Uh, and then this will get us into a discussion of how the New Testament talks about this. Now, I'm just going to highlight some of the interesting things we're going to talk about coming up. Why is the Abrahamic covenant so controversial today? What's the big interpretive dispute about this? To whom, is the, to whom the, do the benefits of the covenant run? And what are some of the options that have been proposed? Yeah, the nation of Israel. Uh, what else? Yeah, or believers now. This is a very hotly contested issue. And I don't propose to solve it next week, uh, but I do propose to show you basically every text in the New Testament that's relevant to the question so that we can at least get a grasp of all the data and start to think about it, not based on what we've heard before, but what the Bible says. I think we'll be surprised at this point in we'll at least be able to see why this debate exists, why there are texts that both sides say, hey, this is my New Testament justification for my view. Uh, and then after we finally get through all the biblical data, eventually we're going to turn around and say, okay, how do people put this together? And we'll look at, look at the arguments people use for saying, well, this, is, this runs to Israel today or this runs only to the church today. And as I said, my point is ultimately not to convince you on one view, but um, to broadly introduce you to a survey of this topic and show you which views I think are out of bounds and then let you pick what you think is most biblical. Uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll let you know what I think at various points. But um, my goal here is that we'll all at least be a little bit more charitable, a little bit better informed, uh, and, and a little bit better able to engage in these discussions uh, as a result of this study. So... Uh, we'll stop here and we'll pick up here next week. Let's pray. God, thank you for your promises to Abraham, which ultimately point to Christ. Thank you that uh, through Abraham you have indeed blessed all the nations of the earth because his descendant is Jesus. Thank you for the gospel in which we stand and by which we're being saved. Thank you for the death and resurrection of Christ which is that great blessing that you promised all those years ago to Abraham, salvation and relationship with you. Thank you that we stand as, as beneficiaries of that today. Lord, we pray that uh, indeed we would be good ambassadors um, before the watching world, that we would strive towards a blameless life. Lord, that indeed you would fulfill all your good word and promises to us as you did for Abraham for all the good things in our lives and all the obedience that we're able to muster ultimately comes from you. You do it all through us. And Lord, we're so thankful for your might and your provision and your faithfulness. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll start the main service in.